So yeah, first of all, thank you all very much for coming in here. Um, there's way more people than we ever would have expected. Um, yeah, and we know it's late in the conference. The last couple of days were, were pretty hard, and uh, we really appreciate yeah your stamina here and um, see it coming holding on until the <laughs> the final end. Um, yeah, one thing before we dive in, I wanted to ask real quick. Um, and on the first day keynote, Chris mentioned that 58% of the participants of this year's KubeCon were like first time participants. So can I just check again, who in here is here for, in the KubeCon for the first time? All right, that's wow. good. Cool, well, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, and, and two of you kind of currently on, in the process of going towards Kubernetes and considering as a productive platform for their, for their workloads. Still a few? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that, that's perfect. We, um, this is, as, as, as has been described, an, an, an intro level talk, and um, I hope we can share some of our experience and, um, and things we've learned so far with you. So this is the, t the title, How to Make Kubernetes Rhyme with uh, Prod Readiness. Um, my name is Matthias. I come from a smaller uh, or medium-sized company in Germany. We are focused on, on software engineering, like modern software, distributed cloud-native cloud and microservices-based software. Um, and I'm here with my colleague. Hi, um, I'm Tiffany Jernigan, and I'm way shorter, so this is kind of fun. Uh, so I am a developer advocate at VMware. So. Actually, I'm curious. Who here has ever heard of the title developer advocate before? OK. Not so much, but still kind of. Yeah, we do stuff like this as part of it. Um, yeah. So uh, it's kind of, VMware is kind of the opposite in the sense we don't have like the consulting, but we have a bunch of our own products that are used in this whole cloud native, Kubernetes, and a lot more space. And uh, if you still use Twitter, uh, we have our Twitter handles at the bottom there. and. I think on my Twitter is my Mastodon link too, so there's just there's things. All right, thanks. So before we dive into the details, we first of all wanted to like share with you how we came to think of, 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 of doing this talk. And this also also a bit to do with what we just said, like what our working backgrounds is. So, so Tiffany is working for a company that basically provides a product um, for running or like a form having Kubernetes production ready with all the things it, it, it should contain, whereas I'm more from like a technology consultancy side where we help people to get their workloads onto the cloud, but also to build their, their stacks and, and maintain them. So with that, we kind of want to combine the things we, we've seen so far and uh, what kind of advice we can give back to you. So in general, uh, we're not a fan of bulleted lists, so you're going to see probably many uh, kind of visualizations in those slides. Uh, I hope they make kind of sense to, to the most of you. So in the end, this is what it's going to be about. So the users and the happiness of the users. So the users are the, the lovely people here on the bottom left. And um, we want to make them happy, of course. I think most of you will, will want to do that too. So um, there is the, the software running in the clouds based on Kubernetes, containerized, um, modern software, and we want to talk about how to enable or make that service good enough that, that all the users are happy. So that kind of brings to the point, what is actually production readiness? I mean, I don't think there is an official, official definition, uh, but if you, uh, we try to kind of summarize it on a high level to say, it's kind of the state of a system which is fully prepared and capable of running prod workloads and provides the level of service and performance required by its users. So again, kind of going back to that picture. Of course, this definition is not uh, like bound or scoped to, to what Kubernetes does. Uh, and not, it's it's way, way more than that. But of course, with this talk, as we are in KubeCon right here, we certainly want to focus on, on cloud native and CNCF based technologies. There's a bit more to it, and I said I don't like bulleted lists, so there's, I think there's, there's another one, but that's, that's going to be it. And I'm not going to read through all of that, but that's a, a couple of more detailed things, um, how we would say, or what we would take into account to have things prod ready. I think the bullet two pretty much summar, summarizes pretty good, so to say, it's in short, it's reliable, stable, and secure. Um, that also inclu includes that 
it performs well under expected and also unexpected conditions, that it's adaptive to changes and basically does whatever it takes um, to be up and healthy and providing the things to the end users. Of course, that includes to be monitored and observable and um, so giving whoever ad ad admin administers that the option to say what's going on currently or make some predictive analysis, what might happen in the future in order to um, take the necessary steps for that. Right, so with that, I'm handing over to Tiffany. All right, so let's first talk a little bit about like what vanilla Kubernetes actually provides. And the concept in general of prod readiness is more than just within the space of Kubernetes, but well, since this is KubeCon, uh, we're basically narrowing down the scope to both like <coughs> Kubernetes and also like the cloud native landscape CNCF type of thing as well. All right, so as kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, this is more of like a like more entry, maybe intermediate level talk. Um, since it's the last day of the conference, I'm assuming that you have learned at least something this week related to Kubernetes. If not, the videos are online, so it's okay. But um, so basically, at a super high level, for anyone who is <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you're all awake. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to put that away here. I don't, I don't know what it was. Go away. <laughs> At a very high level, Kubernetes, basically it runs and manages your container workloads because it's like, hey, I have this application and well, what if I want to have a bunch of versions of that running? What if I want high availability? What I, like, how do I handle all that stuff? So Kubernetes. Um, if you are pretty uh, unfamiliar with Kubernetes still, um, there's a QR code that is up here. Uh, it's for a blog I wrote on getting started with Kubernetes. So might be useful for some people. Um, in this diagram, basically you can just see here's a bunch of users and uh, a bunch of pods that the users are uh, creating. Um, you can see that, for instance, there's these cute little like little log things there because you know people definitely hold out paper nowadays for their logs of Kubernetes. But um, by default in Kubernetes, you can use kubectl and do kubectl get, get logs. If you have access to the uh, control plane, you could go SSH into that and you could find your kubelet logs. Like these logs are all there by default. Um, so as kind of like a high little level, um, Kubernetes is a distributed platform for running, connecting, and logging your containerized workloads. You can do things with being able to uh, scale up, for instance, for your, on the level of infrastructure. Like, after, it's not where you go and say, hey, I'm going to create a Kubernetes cluster. I'm only going to have four nodes. And then later you're like, oh no, now I need 20. I need to kill my cluster or I'm screwed. Like, you can actually just add more nodes and that is totally fine. And as a result, you can also Dynamically, like you can scale it down as well. And if you're using some of the like managed Kubernetes offerings, they make this type of thing a lot easier for you as well. And in addition to being able to scale up and down the infrastructure, you are able to also do that on the workload level. So for instance, you could have a deployment and be like, hey, I want to have 20 copies of my Redis application or whatever you want and have that be highly available. You could have a bunch of nodes, and then it'll distribute those across those different nodes. You can do things like, uh, hey, I'm going to have this new version of whatever I'm running and do some sort of graceful migration. There's also things like fault tolerance. So for instance, assuming you're not using just a plain pod where that's just going to die, and well, you have to start a new one yourself. Um, there will be auto restarts. Uh, if you, there's, uh, as like I was mentioning, there's like load balancing between the uh, different replicas of whatever workload you're running. There's the ability to do scaling. There's the ability to do updates without actually having downtime. So there's just a lot of things that you can have there. So as another like summary of all of those things, um, some of the focus is like having high availability and resilience of your workloads. There's fault tolerance. There's elasticity both of the infrastructure and of the workloads that you have as well, and as well as extensibility. All right, thanks. So I mean, this is was the kind of trying to make sure part we are all on the same page here, and and kind of the common awareness and understanding of, of what Kubernetes will do for you. 
Um, looking back at the topic of production readiness, you can clearly see that the, the core of Kubernetes, or like the, the internal part, uh, which is available all the time, um, has, a, has a strong focus on that reliability and scalability part. So that kind of brings us to the, to the next part to say, okay, if, if I have like my application running in a container and I can deploy it to Minikube or like kind or whatever, how far am I still away um, of, of getting this uh, in, into, a, into a productive landscape. There is actually, you will see there were quite a few things missing and um, it was also a hard time for us to like, like separate them out. So we try to categorize them a little bit, even though you will later on see that a lot of the things will actually kind of overlap and interact with each other. But the, the five main categories where we say there are shortcomings or things that you have to certainly look into and, and work on if you wanna make it or harden it for production is on the one side security, observability on the other, network kind of in, in the middle, infrastructure on the bottom, and the workloads on the top. So I'm gonna tell you what I, what I mean by all those. So um, yeah, if you, if you run Kubernetes, of course you are responsible basically to provide the underlying hardware that it, that it requires. Tiffany has said it's, it's easy to, or it's possible to scale up and down, that's fine. But still, of course, you need to make sure that underlying hardware is available. Um, in addition to that, yeah, it can, these can be VMs, this can be still be our metal, this can be Raspberry Pis, whatever, probably not for productive workloads, but technically it can. Uh, you need to provide the storage uh, the sto and, and the storage classes for the, um, for the persistent volumes. So uh, this is, is actually a good example of how Kubernetes works in many ways here. So there are API objects for storage, for example. There's pers persistent volume claims and persistent volumes, and they will pretty much work the same in every cluster. But still, if you want to have external storage attached, this is something you need to provide and make available so that the API objects of Kubernetes can actually consume that. In addition to that, um, to be on the safe side, of course, we recommend to do backups, both of the cluster infrastructure itself and, and the workloads. And also, if you want to connect to things outside of your Kubernetes world, like say, some kind of managed services like databases, messaging services, or legacy systems, is also your to-do to make those available and accessible from the workloads inside. From infrastructure, we're going to go on to network. Um, I mean, networking is also something which probably every um, Kubernetes user will uh, have to deal with, uh, first of all, of, get, of course, to get the inbound traffic to the application, so to make your ex applications accessible from external users. Um, first thing you probably, there, there are things like ingress, which is again a, a Kubernetes API object, which is kind of the same all the, most of the time, but the ingress controller, for example, that, that implements that, uh, is something you need to define and you need to evaluate and need to make sure it's the right one for your purposes. Now there is this new th thing with the gateway API coming up or you can still add some kind of custom implementation for something exposing load balancer IPs and have um, mappings uh, like a DNS e externally. The possibilities are there. The, the point I'm just trying to make, um, there is no single golden path and it's not gonna be out of the box for you. So you have to basically do that for yourself. Going from external traffic to like internal traffic, this may or may not also be a requirement for you, for example, to encrypt or make or secure connections between workloads in the cluster or in an advanced way to do like weighted routing um, or um, advanced, I would say advanced network features. This is not a requirement everyone has, but certainly people have. And Kubernetes is not providing things out of the box there. So you can use service meshes or something alike to put on top to basically get there. In the end, you want traffic control. So defining network policies, encrypting, or as I said, advanced routing. From network, next part was about observability. So um, yeah, this was also one of the, the hot topics, I think, uh, on, on this KubeCon. I mean, as, as Tiffany said before, Kubernetes provides basic logging. And, and if you have a metric server, you can also get of basic metrics from, uh, from, your, from your nodes and from your pods. But that's probably not what's gonna make you happy all, all in total. So what Kubernetes is kind of missing here as well is like a, a tool stack where you actually persist your information that you're, from your monitoring, something to visualize, something to evaluate. Um, and 
Kubernetes does not go beyond logs. So everything that comes into metrics and traces, you will have to instrument and, and make your workload adaptive to that and make sure it's going to be routed somewhere where you can basically look into that. All right. So um, from, I mean, of course, we can only scratch the surface here. I'm, I'm pretty sure there, there are many more things, um, but we just try to, to summarize that as we only have our half an hour of time. So security is next. Um, and of course, this would certainly be able to fill not only one, but many talks on its own as well. So a couple of things you need to make sure you handle there is, of course, to provide the right people the right access to the various resources. I mean, for example, in most of our productive scenarios, or pretty much all of them, <laughs> we don't give a production access on a kubectl API level to, to any users. We sometimes do that on a, on a time-based or ticket-based thing, so we can really go sure somebody needs to go in there for like getting a log for a certain time period. But in general, we just cut that off. So the right RBAC policies, service accounts, API access limitation, or namespace isolation, depending on the way how you structure your namespaces or if you use multiple clusters. Um, for pod, sec pod security, these are all things um, which, which are very important and probably not, there's probably even more to that, uh, but we're going to leave it with that. Or should, should I add something? I mean, there, there's also stuff like dealing with certificates or like OIDC tokens. There's also things with like some sorts of secrets manager, so that way you don't accidentally do something like committing your secrets up to GitHub because it happens and I may have posted secrets at some point. <laughs> yeah. Please don't do that. But I guess you knew it already. Um, now, some, something which is arguably a part of Kubernetes or not are other workloads. Um, I mean, in the end, the, your consuming users of your application will probably not care uh, if wherever they run and what, which program language they will be written in and how containerized they are. But in general, the production readiness of your overall system is, of course, the combination of the runtime and the workloads on top. And, and of course, that means um, if you, have, if you like, harden your cluster in the best possible way and still fail on your, on your workload aspects, that's probably not going to be a, a great thing. So the question is, of course, then, what can you do on the workload side to go in the same direction and make them stable, secure, observable, and so on? So I hope this is. Uh, visible well. I mean, this is basically more like a, a software engineering best practice than actually looking too much into Kubernetes. But um, of course, we always recommend to automate all the steps and, may, and, and get like in a re repeatable, continuous way. So you, that, that you have a chain from, from source code up until your productive runtime where there are basically no manual steps involved, where you can all do the, the, the compilation, the testing, the packaging, containerization, and then later on push out to the, to, to the cluster. Um, and of course, you should make one of this secure as well. So basically, en encrypt your, um, your images, make sure you have safe base images or use technologies like build packs that, that take the thing, things away from you. Um, to basically say, okay, this, we can kind of call this a Git SecOps workflow where all the things are coming from. Now, this is the summary kind of all those shortcomings. Um, and yeah, this slide is intended to look as chaotic because this, um, these are all the things and potentially more that you have to worry about in order to make your, your cluster in a way that you can say, okay, I'm, I'm feeling safe to deploy things um, to, to the world, and, and, and I'm not worried about things going wrong. So um, with this, what, so, I mean, what, what can you do then? I mean, how can you approach? Um, there is, again, no golden path, but just being aware of the things you actually have to do, you can start approaching that, that, that problem scenario. So some checklist might help. I mean, this checklist has no like, uh, aspect of being all the way complete. It's probably because each of the checklists will be different. You will have different workloads, different client scenarios, and so on. But just going over it and say, OK, do I, have I covered all those things? Are they working well? Have I them tested them thoroughly um, is definitely a thing to approach there. So while this was all completely conceptual, we'll now look a bit more into actually how can you approach this with technology from the, 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 the CNCF world. OK, so who here has been in like the booth area at, during this conference? 
Not that is way less than I expected. Okay, sure. Uh, as the people have, you can pro or probably see that there is just so many booths. The entire floor is tons of different companies, tons of different project booths, et cetera. That kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of like how vast the cloud native slash Kubernetes landscape basically is. Um, this lovely image, if you are able to read any one thing on here, um, can I like get your vision because I can't. Um, there's just so much stuff that is in there. Like someone posted a little bit earlier that in like 2017, there was only I think like seven projects that were part of the CNCF. And this is what we're at now. It's a lot. So obviously I can't, I don't know about every single one of these things. I don't think that's possible at least. It's not possible for me. Maybe someone here knows about all of them and wow, you rock. But um, what we're gonna try to do next is to, for all of those uh, categories that we had just gone through, to list a few open source products that we thought either are things that are like uh, graduated, incubating, sandboxed, or tools that we may have specifically had some interaction with. It doesn't mean that anything else is any less valid. They totally are, but I can't talk about those ones yet. All right. So first on infrastructure. So there is cluster API, which is this cute little like turtles all the way down thing going on. Um, there's also Valero. So these two on the left are specifically focused on Kubernetes. So cluster API, you do things, you have an existing Kubernetes cluster, you use CRDs to be able to uh, spin up new clusters and deal with managing and things like that. And then there's Valero, so that's like backing up the workloads that you have. It also backs up your persistent volumes. Then on the other side of things a little bit, uh, there's Terraform, Crossplane, and Pulumi. So they're, they're infrastructure as code, and you can use it to create a bunch of different resources, which can be Kubernetes infrastructure as well. All right, so networking. So we have Istio and Linkerd, which are specifically on the side of having service mesh. I mean, they're more than just networking. As we were kind of saying, a bunch of these things kind of like overlap into different categories. So that also falls in under security and observability as well. There is also Cilium, which is based on eBPF. So basically, instead of like with uh, Istio and Linkerd, where you end up having a second container that is running in your every single one of your pods, this actually is interacting on like the node level. So it can do things like service mesh. It can also do things like observability, etc. There is also Antrea, and that implements the CNI or container network interface and also the Kubernetes network policy, so it helps with network connectivity and security for your pod workloads. For observability, uh, I feel like a lot of people in general have probably seen a lot of Prometheus and Grafana kind of being like two things together. Um, so you have Prometheus where you have a bunch of metrics, and then Grafana is there for you to be able to visualize all that. It can be kind of chaotic for some people, such as myself, to look at just like, here's a ton of numbers inside of Prometheus, but like, I want to actually see what does that look like, how has that changed, and be able to do things with it. Then there's Kiali, which is for observability on service meshes, which is kind of relevant since we just mentioned service meshes. Um, there's open telemetry, so that's kind of a standard for like things with integration layers for like logs, metrics, traces. Uh, there's also Jaeger, which is for distributed tracing. There's Fluent D, which is also for logging. It's quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, it just keeps going. Uh, so security. Um, so there's a Open Policy Agent or OPA. As you can tell, there's a lot of acronyms or a lot of long words here. Um, so that one and Caverno are for policy-based control. There's Cert Manager, which that one is very self-explanatory. It deals with managing certificates. Um, we have Keycloak, so for identity access and management, which is IAM. Um, there's Spiffy, and there's also Spire. Just kind of ran out of room, but Spiffy and Spire kind of go hand in hand, um, and they're for an identity control plane across infrastructure. There's also Intoto, and that is for like supply chain integrity. So like if you think back to that GitSec ops slide where it had all those little uh, locks at the bottom of each path along the, like starting from your code to building, all of those things, you need to worry about hardening your security all the way along the chain. 
and that includes making sure that you have some sort of tools that can help you go along with doing that. Additionally, then there are the workloads because, yeah, you have a production-ready Kubernetes cluster, but if you're not running any workloads on it, it really doesn't matter. No one's using your things. So who here has dealt with YAML in Kubernetes? <laughs> All right, <laughs> cool, a lot of you. Okay, there's a lot of YAML. I mean, sometimes you can get by with doing like some kubectl things, but overall, there's gonna be a lot of YAML, especially if you start doing, once you're at the point of dealing with CI, CD. And so there are tools that can help you with that. So things, there's like Helm, uh, there's a tool in the Carvel tool suite, that's YTT, that basically, instead of doing a bunch of copy pasting of your YAML and changing a few things, you can have a few consistent ones and have like pull in variables from other files and just do a bunch of different things with that. Carvel also has a bunch of other tools in there for being able to, like, different ways of running your applications. Things like Cap Controller, where it can deal with, like, say you have stuff that you're pushing to GitHub and be able to update things based on that. And there's a bunch of other things there. Um, there's Harbor. And, I mean, if you don't have a container image stored somewhere, you don't have an application. So basically, you need Harbor for that. Um, and Harbor also uh, falls a bit into the security side, too. Um, since it has image scanning. And then we also have on the uh, CD or continuous deployment side, so like on the GitOps stuff, we have Flux and Argo. And then there's also build packs. So like perhaps you're very familiar with using Docker files to go and be like, hey, I want to do all these things to create my container image. Whereas with build packs, it's here's my Java code, here's my Go code, here's my whichever supported code, make me a container image. I don't want to write a Docker file. So I guess the question is like, all right, now what do we do? Like we have all of this stuff, but we need to figure out things of like, how, where are we running it? How are we doing that? So um, in 2019, which honestly feels kind of like quite a long time ago now, um, Kelsey basically was saying that it is your responsibility to purchase staff, patch, scale, and upgrade. So that is a lot of stuff that you have to deal with if you want to do all of that. You need to make sure all your versions and everything are in sync because if they don't work together, then everything is just going to crash and burn. So we kind of, this isn't like the one ultimate way of separating these things out. This is kind of our way of separating these things out. There's little dot, dot, dots because there's obviously paths that are in between. Um, so on the far left side here, I don't even know if you can see my laser, but there is one, and uh, yeah, that side. Uh, so that whole section is basically saying you are managing all of these things. So everything from the infrastructure, the hardware, like, hardware for that, like you have your own data center and you're dealing with all that. You're managing Kubernetes, you're managing the security, the network, the observability, like, and then on top of that, also your apps and your workloads. Then there is this concept of basically managed. So instead of, like you still have to deal with the apps, the workloads, and you still have to do the security networking visibility by yourself, but the infrastructure, the hardware, and Kubernetes is managed by some sort of provider. So for instance, like GKE, or EKS, or AKS, or a bunch of the other things, where they're handling those things for you. Then we just made this term called fully managed. There's a little star there because, I mean, again, it's not some official name. But basically, it's on top of that, it's adding that layer for the security network and observability, which is basically all those things that we've kind of been talking about this entire talk that are fitting in right there as well that can be managed with things. Um, so this is just like an example from a Tanzu Kubernetes grid, um, basically showing you a bunch of the open source projects that they specifically picked to fill those voids in what is needed to be production ready with Kubernetes. Like you probably recognize almost, every, I think only Calico wasn't on another slide or something, but like most all of these were on that. So it's just a like a bunch of projects working together to be able to come to some sort of endpoint. And this can be run either on cloud or on-prem. All right, so um, I'm taking over here real quick just for this one slide um, where you can see another kind of stack 
of similar components being grouped together in, in a cluster. So we from Novatech, we provide also training uh, on Kubernetes for our clients where we have an own implementation. So we're not building a product. Um, we basically started building the cluster from scratch, not exactly from scratch, we used to manage cluster, deployed via Terraform on Azure, and assembled all those projects inside to make them part of the training. And yeah, I know it doesn't make sense to run Istio and Linkerd in the same cluster, just, yeah, this is only for training purposes. But in the end, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that this definitely gives us quite a bit of a hard time to keep all the ways in sync. I mean, sometimes the, the cluster needs to get updated from the provider. Sometimes the projects get updated, and we always need to validate our, is all the, the entire matrix of the, of the projects still working together well. And um, this is exactly what a, what a managed product, project is basically trying to solve for you. So I'm going to give back. OK. So um, there's a couple choices that you still have to make. So there's, do I want to be on the cloud or do I want to be on-prem? So for instance, if you have like a ton of bare metal sitting around, you just have all these servers, then you probably want to end up going to on-prem unless you just have buckets of money or something. Um, if you have some sort of sensitive app, so say something like military, intelligence, medical, then there's the question of, can, is there a cloud in my country that will allow me to actually run these types of workloads on them? If no, then you're having to do it on-prem. And if yes, on the cloud. And pretty much every other scenario, we're suggesting that you go and run it on the cloud. Then there's the concept of, do I want to deal with managed or self-hosted? So for the most part, if you're on-prem, you probably end up having to just go down the route of self-hosted. If you have a super huge cluster and there's not enough support from any of the providers, then same direction. If you need to use the newest Kubernetes features or you want to be able to, like, you want to use the latest Kubernetes version since most providers are a tiny bit behind, um, or if you want to be able to enable some, like, beta or alpha things, same thing. And if for some reason you tried it really, really hard and tried all of them and nothing seems to work, you fall into that last bucket, but otherwise, try managed. So, like, uh, a quote from uh, Jerome. Uh, Petazoni is the fastest, easiest, and cheapest way to run your Kubernetes cluster is to get someone else to do it for you. So, just a suggestion there. All right. So, yeah, again, we probably should highlight Jerome a little bit more yeah. because he was also, he, he gave the name to our talk. Uh, he was actually the creator of that title. So, thanks again for your, your help, not only with the title, but also with your feedback. And so, I'm trying to, to, to bring this to an end with the second bulleted list slide that we have. I mean, um, in the end, the, why, why we're doing this is just basically to to show you and indicate um, it, it will take quite a bit more than just putting your application in a container and, and writing some YAML files to deploy that. The way you approach it, there, there are various options. I mean, and, and I'm going to start diplomatic here and say, in, in the end, there is no right or wrong on, on any of these approaches. It's more about your decision um, where you want to invest the time and money in. And, and there can be multiple drivers for either side of the decision. I mean, sometimes it can be definitely desired that you want to maintain the stack yourself. That certainly means you need to invest in the skill of the people that are doing that, but in turn, you have that skill in-house, which can, of course, be a valuable thing. In other cases, it might be that you say, yeah, I, I don't need all that. I, um, I just want to focus on deploying my applications fast, and I want all this management be done by somebody else. Then you go for the, for the managed solution. In that case, you pay the price to the service provider. And this is uh, something that everybody has to decide uh, for themselves, given under the um, like restrictions or, or guidelines that, that Tiffany had just said. In general, if you can basically speak of a general rule, what we always would suggest from our experience is say, go with the highest abstraction possible. I mean, in the end, don't try to solve problems again that somebody else has already solved. So maybe somebody has already figured out which kind of combinations from security, uh, observability, networking, whatever tools will actually work. Um, so you don't have to redo that over and over, and, and that's what they, what they offer as a service. Um, and the more, of course, you already build on a battle-proof or well-tested platform, the more it enables you to spend the money and the time that you have in basically your core value, which is supposedly, and, and that's, I might be blurred there because I'm coming from like a 
sub, uh, software engineering background, but it's, the value, it's, it's like the application logic of your applications and not the configuration of your, of your infrastructure. So in the end, um, if there is a managed solution that suits your need, I would recommend to go for it. If you want to set yourself, also try and fi reach out to people that can help you with that. Because this landscape is changing, the technology is constantly refreshing. So my, people are ba there are people out there that provide training, that provide enablement, provide their insights, that can certainly help you to, to save some time. And I think we are on the edge. So this is, uh, if you want to, you can g certainly give us feedback on that presentation. Again, if a big apologies if we missed some one or the other technologies that you would have liked to see on one of those pages. Uh, the, this has no uh, guarantee of completion whatsoever. It's mostly a few things that we have already worked with in the past um, or like from, from, from products that we know. But of course, there might be many out there which do this, things in the in same or better ways. So is something missing here doesn't certainly mean we don't think it's, it, it's great. I just wanted to make that sure. And uh, if you have any further questions, again, feel free to, to connect to us. You will find us on LinkedIn under our names, or these are Twitter handles. And with that, I think we would like to say thanks for listening. Thank you. I'm a little bit over. Yeah. <laughs>